Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Christ of Annapolis. Spring is here. I'm Kathy McFadden, moderator, and grateful to be with you today. Pastor's message this week is about the how the labor movement in May 1st of 1886, with over 300,000 laborers organized 13,000 businesses across the United States to walk off their jobs and declare the standardization of an eight hour workday without pay. And that was done without the internet, Zoom, any other um, type of um, media, media except for word of mouth and magazines or newspapers and that type of stuff to get that message out there. It is hard to believe 134 years later, the workers not only have to fight and beg their employers and the government to get those <clears throat> protective gear to save their lives, but not only the lives of the workers, but of their families from COVID-19. Please keep all of those who risk their lives every day for us in your prayers. The labor union is very near and dear to my heart. My father and father-in-law were both involved in the unions. And my husband and I have was involved for over decades, about three decades in the labor movement too. I have a few announcements today. Just a reminder, every Sunday there is a Bible study from 9.05 to almost as we um, enter the 10 o'clock hour. And there's a coffee hour um, right after this, which was very fun last week. We had a lot of people show up. So uh, if you wanna have a little bit of uh, laughter after service, please join us at the coffee hour. Um, also join us tonight uh, for Evolve Sacred Gathering at 6 p.m. We also have Living the Question uh, group study every, um, every other Wednesday at 9.30 or 9.30 a.m. Children's Bible study is Thursday from 11.30 to 12 with Pastor Ryan for a message from the children and the youth. Um, you'll need a password to get on, which that is emailed out to you. Pastor Ryan's office hours um, are weekly um, from Tuesday morning from 9 to 10. Um, also, we have the social, um, the UCC social hour. So join us and connect with friends and neighbors for a weekly Zoom social. Um, check in other um, engagements for the conversations and, and fun. Um, ACT has, an, <clears throat> has a volunteer database. For those who want to volunteer, you can go on ACT, A-C-T, I-A-F, dot org, slash volunteer. Even the county goes there to look for volunteers. I hope you have a great day and enjoy our service. Thank you. The grace and peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. So with you. My name is Andrew Hanauer and it is my joy to worship with you church on this day, the fourth Sunday of Easter. And to you Star Wars fans out there, may the fourth be with you. This service order has been posted on Facebook and emailed out. Please fee feel free, excuse me, to download it from there. And now let us all join together in our call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We know these words, we trust these words, and yet we do want security, certainty, concrete hope, <clears throat> family, employment, meaning in our lives, success for our children, God, remind us anew that you are the good shepherd. You have not forsaken us. Call us into your path, your way of faith, hope, and love. Redefine in us your understanding of what our lives are about, what success truly means, and what faith, hope, and love are in this time. Open our ears that we may listen and our lips so our mouths may proclaim your praise. Peace be with you and also with you. And now please share a sign of peace by commenting on the live stream page, sending a text to someone, or just shouting peace to the world.
words for the hymn this morning, but the melody is going to be just a little different. So let's have a sing along with Kathleen. <laughs> Let us pray. God, we have called on you to be the good shepherd. Our ancestors entrusted their lives to you as we do now. Gather us, this church, from our various places together, just as you have gathered people together from various places since the beginning. Seek us out where we may be found. Remind us of the journey we have in front of us. Remind us of the obstacles that face us. Remind us that while you are with us, bringing us to green pastures, that there is a journey ahead, and it's not always easy. Grant us the courage to take that journey with you, learn what we should, and continue to reach out to one another along the way. Amen. Amen. Friends, we are on a journey, and the journey is not always easy, and it does require quite a few obstacles to overcome. But we also know that while we make that journey, sometimes we wish we didn't have to do it. Sometimes we fight against it. And sometimes we do things that we're not quite so proud of. And so we offer up a moment where together we can reflect on those things that we feel keep us from God and separate us from one another. A time of assurance and pardon, or pardon and assurance as we usually put it. So please join with me. Trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen.
So church, back when I was in seminary, I had this idea that I wanted to go into an urban city church. I wanted things to be gritty. I wanted things to be real. I wanted it to be a whole different thing. But, and we come to this children's message here, I found myself instead living in the countryside. And when I woke up in the morning, I literally could look out my window, pastoring this church while I was in seminary, and see sheep. There were fields of sheep outside my window. This was not brick and mortar, urban gritty stuff. This was the rural, pastoral, wonderfully beautiful countryside of Little Baddow in Essex, England, which is east of London, just a little touch north, just, just a little bit. And so there I was um, looking at sheep. And so I thought, well, when it came time to do a placement, perhaps I should go up to North Northumberland, the home of wool making itself in old England and check in on some shepherds. And so that's what we did. Um, I went up for a couple weeks and spent time amongst shepherds, staying on the place where sheep were actually taken care of. I knew nothing about what I was doing. I knew nothing about the life there. I, I didn't understand it at all. I grew up in suburban Orlando, Florida. We are known for Mickey Mouse, not sheep. And I was hoping to get into a place of urban ministry. And so here I was with my muck boots on and everything else traipsing ups and down, and the only, only character in our family who was good at looking after sheep was my dog. At least he had this weird instinct of thinking he could corral sheep. I don't think he was very good at it, but the few times he tried, he was very excited. And so I didn't know much about shepherding, but one of the things that was happening up there in this very northern part of England, really cold, by the way, um, for a poor Floridian like me, was that there was that um, people were going around, and the church had been doing this, and they were listening to stories of shepherds. And they were listening to stories of people who spent a lot of their time alone looking after sheep. And they were doing these stories because there aren't that many shepherds left anymore, believe it or not. There's not as many as there used to be. Um, it's become large scale and mass produced. But in England here, were, there were still some people alive who had spent their lives out on the hills where it's just green hills, very few trees, lots of pastures, and sheep and rocks. And one of the stories that they would tell was how difficult it was, how lonely they got, how hard it was to keep the sheep together, to keep them to the place that they needed to go and to move them around. They had to move them around because the sheep were grazing on the grass out there, on the country, out there in the countryside. But they could to get to the grass, they had to go up hills and around hills and down hills, so it was a really hard thing to do. And then to get to the gate, you had to get a lot of sheep that were used to going wherever they wanted to actually get to the place where they needed to get sheared. The wool would be literally sheared off of them. And so Jesus talks a lot about being a shepherd and how difficult it is. And so here's a question for us, because we're not together. When we do the children's Bible message in, on Sunday, how many of you are kind of just running around just a little bit from here and there? Uh, how many of you are sitting still exactly as you should, listening to everything I'm saying? For those of you who can't see it, the other people who are joining on Zoom, they're all saying they sat still. But I don't think that that's everybody here. Not even my, my own son is sitting still during the children's message. And I imagine right now that perhaps you're not either. But the idea is that when we're used to roaming around, sometimes it's difficult for us to know when it's time to come in. And yet all of us still try really hard to do that. We still know that there's something that we're supposed to do, but it's always kind of difficult when we're used to doing really hard things on our own. And the reality is that we need to be able to do both. And so I know it can be hard sometimes to sit still, and sometimes we have to, and sometimes we have to learn how to run around. But part of the message that, um, that Jesus is sharing with us in our Bible reading today is finding that time to be able to sit still, be where we need to be, and also finding that time to know when it's time to run around and do that. And I know that's hard, and I know it's difficult to figure out when, but that's the challenge that we have right now, especially since we can't all be together and we can't really go where we need to go, and we might be sick and tired of sitting down. But Jesus calls us together 
and also calls us to go out and up and down those fields. And so however you're doing it, I hope you're finding a good way to do it and learning, but also growing in both the sitting and the moving. Let us pray. Loving God, we are grateful for the journey of running around. But God, let us also be grateful for the journey of sitting, of hearing, and of listening to what you call us to do. Let us pray the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's talk about fences. In the period 2004 through 2011, my career was in fences. That is, I was executive director of the American Fence Association and its related associations, the simply named Vinyl Fence Deck and Railing Manufacturers Association and the Composite Deck Manufacturers Association. I worked with companies that manufacture and distribute fencing and decking and fence and deck contractors across the country. I manage a group of staff members and fencing experts to provide our annual week-long fence installation school at both the University of Georgia and in Tulsa, where we taught contractors employees how to properly install all kinds of fencing from chain link and wood to vinyl and high security like you will find around embassies, nuclear sites, and other sensitive facilities. It is therefore ironic that I have never personally owned, much less installed, a fence. My parents had a fence, which I remember my dad installing. My mother was enamored of California design. So of course, our fence was a low two-board redwood fence straight out of Sunset Magazine. Neighbors next to my houses have built fences, but at my last home in Illinois, there were no fences separating Sherry and me from our backdoor neighbors. Somehow we and those who preceded us and who moved in later opted for a park-like setting without fences. We all took care of our yards and enjoyed a larger grass and gardens tract with houses at the edges. I've been ruminating not only about what fences have meant to me, but more holistically about whether they work and whether we even need them at all. Here's a little secret from the fence industry. A fence works more from a psychological perspective than as an actual physical barrier. A determined person can almost always get over, under, or through most any fence. Smugglers and traffickers are even getting through Mr. Trump's vaunted border fence by using blowtorches to cut out sections. The casual visitor to my mom's yard would have known where the family property ended and would have respected that boundary, but not even our cat was blocked by that two board redwood fence. Last summer, my neighbor here in Annapolis had an eight foot wood fence built between our yards. I delight in watching my cat Meepers, he's behind me, scale it, alternatively using his claws to enable him to climb straight up and over or taking an eight foot bound to the top. No, fences are more for demarcation and psychological effect 
than for actual 100%, you can't get in here or out of here security. So our fence is necessary. My mother used to tell of her encounter with the poet Robert Frost when she was in college. Frost had read some of his poems at a seminar. Afterward, my mother, fascinated with his poetry, asked the renowned writer about his method. Did he keep a notebook, jotting down observations and ideas as he went through his day? Frost brushed her off, the crusty New Englander saying something like, no, young lady, why would you think I would do that? And then walked off. My mother's opinion of Frost thereafter was not positive. I raised Frost because of his poem, Mending Wall, in which as they are repairing the wall between their properties, his neighbor asserts, good fences make good neighbors. Maybe there is a human need to demarcate, to separate, to say, stay here and don't go there. Certainly we are fenced more than ever now, fenced into our houses and apart from one another when we are in public. Even on Zoom, we're fenced off into little boxes. I think I've never had a fence, never been a fan of all but decorative fences because of the fact that they are meant to separate us. Fences encourage thinking of other people as well, the other. Fences are a form of alienation, of being withdrawn or separated. As Christians, I believe we're called not to be alienated from our fellow men and women, but to embrace and uplift them. I pray that the big lesson we all learn from this pandemic is that we are all in this together as one body and that life is so much better when we are not fenced off and facing barriers to togetherness. I pray that many fences, psychological and real, meant to keep out and keep in, fall away. From Mending Wall by Robert Frost. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. Thank you, Lee. That's, that was awesome. Listen now in the reading of scripture for the word and wisdom of God. We open our hearts to the word and wisdom of God. Uh, this morning, we're going to be reading from the book of First Peter, chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. For it is a credit to you. If, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly, if you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Our second reading today is John 10, 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand 
what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus declares himself in this passage, a gatekeeper and the gate itself. He is the shepherd of the sheep. He is the keeper of this pasture. But I looked at this word gatekeeper in my head and I realized the modern word is so often used with a negative connotation. We often take gatekeeping to mean an arbitrary limitation on who can be included or excluded. And yet in this passage, Jesus declares himself a gatekeeper in a completely different way. He is the protector of his people the one who chooses who is safe to enter and have access to his flock. He is the valid point of entry to all who would try and access his people. The pasture is a safe place for his flock. It, is a cre it creates a sense of security and normalcy for the sheep. The fence is also, as Lee said, a declared boundary to others that the space is no longer open territory for those to freely cross. Yet, even with fences, we built gate openings so that those who are allowed in can freely pass to and from the space. Those who enter by the gate are known to the sheep. They're the ones who bring food, who tend to them, who care for them. All that make entry by other means are violating a stated boundary. They are therefore unknown. They are dangerous. They are risk to normalcy and stability of a herd. And often when we think about pastures, we think about a gated pasture, but many do not have hinged gates like we might see in, in the modern era. 
in many of these times, the shepherd literally acted as a gate across this narrow fence opening, keeping watch at this point to make sure that none entered or exited. Shepherds would often sleep across it. And in that way, their body became a literal gate. Them putting their own body on the line so that the sheep would not leave and wander off into danger. The shepherd was the one who made sure that those who were entering were people who would care for them. These caregivers may be hired hands that would bring them food or water the, or who would lead them as Ryan said, to new pastures so that they could graze in safer places or in new places. The sheep would know their caregivers. It would know the hired hands who often probably talked to them or sang by themselves on lonely nights. Yet if we read further into this passage, even the hired hands leave when there is danger. A true shepherd remains. The true shepherd is to be trusted in times of distress when enemies jump the fence and all other false leaders scatter, Jesus declares himself in this, the true shepherd. Referencing Psalm 23, Jesus is declaring himself the one who puts his own body and life on the line so that his sheep and followers remain safe in his care, even through the valley of death. Now, <sighs> In these challenging times, it feels all too often like reality itself may have tried to jump the fence into our safe pastures. During such communal strain, we too return to the things that are most familiar and comfortable to us. Like sheep in pasture, we huddle to what is familiar so we may maintain a feeling of safety in the face of the unknown. We do this as both individuals walling up in ourselves and as groups of people, evaluating where we find boundaries, behaviors, and people that allow us to feel most safe. And we cling to them in these moments. But this scripture makes me ask, who are our shepherds in this time? Who are the hired hands who abandon their duties out of fear? Who are the thieves trying to lead us astray? And with whom do we feel most safe? Jesus warns us in this text that others have tried to command and mislead his flock, but that the sheep will still listen to him because he is known and trusted. This shows the importance of familiarity with times of chaos and uncertainty and danger. It it leads us to really look at the ways in which we are drawing in on ourselves. What are we doing in this chaos? Who are the voices of those that we already trust and love above all others? Who are our steady points in this chaos of uncertainty? We also may find that there are things that we find familiar that may not be the healthiest things for us. Because truly the familiar may feel safe because it was something we used in the past, but now we are having to work even harder to build healthy community and healthy coping mechanisms, despite all this extra strain. Regardless of where you fall in these times, these are the very real aspects of living in a world that has changed our perceptions of safety and community. Regardless of whether we lean to vice or virtue or some chaotic mix in between, the things that we have familiarity with are the things we return to. It is understandable. We turn to things we know, but it's important that we also realize that we not judge ourselves too harshly for the things that are comfortable. Yet it does call us into a space where we must evaluate these fences and the uses of fences in our lives. It is okay if you need to withdraw to some degree, to step away from things that you would normally manage but now find too taxing. It is okay to have some impulses towards problematic coping mechanisms. 
Try not to judge yourself in these moments because it is important to simply acknowledge that these feelings and impulses are a barometer of strain, that your mind and body are telling you that a new boundary needs to shift. As good shepherds of ourselves, we must determine where our own fences and boundaries are under these new conditions. They have likely changed with a sudden shift and we might find ourselves quite irritated and reactive to the smallest inconveniences because it is simply one more thing that has to be considered in an already overwhelming shift of baselines. Our comfort zones likely have become significantly smaller than they were before. Leaving the house may seem like a huge chore and there is no shame in this. One reason we can normally cope with the little things of life is that our daily lives are often consistent enough that we process these things in the autopilot functions in our minds. We no longer have to handle them with our conscious processing. Yet when life becomes disrupted, the basic psychological fact is that suddenly we are having to use processing energy to navigate the things we normally don't have to think about. Grocery shopping, when your normal products are not available, having to ensure you meet the ever-changing guidelines of physical distancing, being vigilant about yourself and others in a time where there's this invisible threat in the world. These aspects have taken things that were routine for us. They have turned them into activities requiring inordinate amounts of mental and emotional processing. These daily tasks can no longer fade into our mental autopilots. And therefore, we all find ourselves exhausted with simple daily living. This is why so many of us are tired, so emotionally overwrought, so volatile internally and often, to be fair, externally in this time. We have to find new ways to find healthy boundaries and healthy community, perhaps to draw in a bit, to ensure that we are spending our energy wisely rather than frenetically with reactivity and panic. Lee already mentioned Robert Frost, which I thought was fitting because I have Robert Frost's name in the next line. Good fences make good neighbors, may ring particularly true in these times because not because the good fences make good neighbors, but that we are all having to renegotiate boundaries in nearly every aspect of our lives. From navigating the new space at home with family to navigating personal boundaries as we deal with work and school invading our personal space and personal time, to learning how to negotiate a digital world that now seemingly has constant access to us when we are at home. The delineation between home life, work life, and personal life are blurring even more than they were before COVID-19. Times of struggle can also highlight some of our own vulnerabilities and bring up things that we need help with. It can bring up agitation, and perhaps old bad habits can bring up volatility and strain. But if we face these things intentionally and do not demonize them, we can see them for what they are. They are just a guide map to what actually feels safe for each of us. We need not build fences. Perhaps we just put a little flag or build a garden. We find a way to mark what is ours and we look at our emotions not as enemies and certainly not as a dichotomy of good or evil, but simply a guide to help find the places that are in need of attention, that might still be wounded, that might need a little extra care in these volatile times. Now, I admit this requires mental and emotional effort to process. It takes time and energy to establish new boundaries, and certainly the energy to do this work is something that could be in short supply. Yet, it can be something that saves our sanity if we are intentional with it. Like a shepherd, we must mark off what is our new safe pasture and build behavioral fences around those places. 
Like a shepherd, we must guard against those who would harm us or jump the fences. Yet like the sheep, we must also find and occupy that safe pasture space so that we have time to listen to the voices of shepherds who have our best interests at heart. It can seem like too much. So don't be afraid to be a careful steward of your own energetic and emotional resources. Whatever you are capable of doing right now is enough. Whoever you feel most comfortable reaching out to and contacting is enough. I am more than aware that we cannot always set firm boundaries in all areas of our lives, especially when it comes to compromises of work life and family dynamics. Yet taking control of even a small pasture of your own and declaring it yours can help stabilize the rest so that you can handle the chaos that must be handled. So don't be afraid to seek out safe zones or trusted people. Feel free to look at who and what represents safety to you in this time and reach out if you can to others because you may be their safe harbor too. But be gentle with yourselves and with others as you can. But as every fence and boundary has, there is always an opening for a gate. And we have to remember to leave the gate space because we all need people who are allowed in. That is to me what community means in this time. Each of us taking turns being both shepherd and sheep, figuring out the new ways that we need to build safe pasture and engage the world so we can best survive the hardships that life has handed us. Yet also as followers of Christ, Jesus has declared himself our ultimate protector and the true shepherd we should cling to in times of strain. So it is on us to also remember whose voice and whose example we should follow in order to help sustain us through these times of trouble. The Lord is our shepherd and with one another in community together, we will not want. Amen. 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 And thank you. That was Chris Wilson, a member in discernment for ministry at our church. Um, thank you for bringing that message, Chris, about fences and boundaries. Friends, our church is an active voice in our community. We partner with other congregations and other faith communities to do work, some of the work we do ourselves as well. All of that work is done because you give of your time, of your energy, of your money. And we give you thanks for all of those gifts, for the work that we are able to do work that has enabled us to continue to support households as they go through this difficult time, people who are out of work and trying to discern what steps they need to take next, we have been able to support. We've been able to support feeding people across this county. We've been able to support one another in prayer and in calling and in fellowship. Whatever gifts it is that we are able to give, we give you thanks for them. We now come to a time where we can offer those gifts up. And I invite you, if you're able to give of gifts of money, there's a link in your bulletin, or you can go to uccannapolis.org forward slash donate. And I also invite you to please, during this time, to pray over what other ways that you're able to offer up your gifts, to volunteer at um, actiaf.org slash volunteer, or to find other ways to do that as well and for what ways and what people that you can reach out into this congregation to make sure that we all know that we are all connected. Thank you for all your gifts and your giving.
Gracious God, we thank you for the ability to give, for the ability to give of our time, of our talents, for the ability to give on this journey. We thank you for the message that we have received this morning from Chris. We thank you for the team that has been able to gather together to bring this worship. We thank you for the ability to continue to support and discern your call to us as the United Church of Christ of Annapolis and as part of the body of Christ in our community and in our world. Bless all of our gifts. Amen. Friends, we gather here from so many different places. You may still be lying in bed and that's okay. You may be in your kitchen. You may be uh, in a garden path. You may be out for a walk somewhere. I don't know where you are, but we're glad that you're able to gather here together. And we invite ourselves to share in prayers as well that we can share in this time. And we invite you to, to post that on the chat. I, I've been actually writing on that throughout this. Um, and so it's been lovely to see people's names there. But if there's anything in particular that you wish to lift up in prayer at this time, please post it there and uh, we can share those prayers together. Um, and so thank you for those prayers. Friends, we come to a time where we share our prayers with one another, prayers of hope, prayers of sadness, prayers of joy, prayers of concern. All of these things we carry together in our journey as people of faith. And so we invite ourselves to lift them up with one another and we share each one ending with God in your mercy, hear our prayers, or God in your grace, hear our prayers, or as is so often the case, God in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. From Martin, we have a prayer for thanks to all those who are giving their financial support and their service to uh, the United Church of Christ and to their ACT communities. And Martin, we give you thanks for your leadership on um, researching and looking, working through unemployment in a time when that has certainly spiked and is affecting people more and more as well. So thank you for all your leadership uh, to everybody who's doing work. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Um, from Sandy, prayers for those struggling with mental illness dur during this time, uh, for those with OCD and addictions, that they see the hope in, our, in, in Christ. God, in your grace, hear our prayers and mercy. Um, Rick Dove offers up prayers of thanks for the wonderful doctors and nurses at Anne Arundel Medical Center. And Rick, we offer up especially prayers for your son who went through a very um, rough chapter this week, um, but was able to be cared for by the hospital and is home now. God, in your mercy and in your grace, hear our prayers. Um, from Jesse, prayers for uh, his friend Maureen, as the recent storms have worsen, worsened the ditch, Jesse has been working on a watershed program um, in a community in Annapolis uh, that has had a lot of drainage issues around, um, around the good housing, just, just down the road from our church, in fact. And Jesse, we pray for you for that work. We pray for Maureen and her leadership in that community. Um, and we pray for the work that can be done to alleviate those problems. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Um, from Aaron, prayers, blessings for Art and Rockville family time. Uh, it was a perfect day yesterday. Family is important. Um, Aaron, we pray with you and we pray with one another as well for that time that we can find to be together and to be able to share that time together. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Um, I get, offer up a prayer as well for, um, for people who are working in, um, in food, I've been finding myself awash in thinking about food, um, thanks to a uh, friend Monica with um, Feed Anne Arundel and ACT and finding ourselves trying to think about how we can continue to provide food, but also um, on phone calls that I was on this week about uh, evictions and um, threats of evictions. Even though they've been stayed, um, it doesn't mean that people still aren't receiving um, challenges as they try to face how to pay their bills and try to keep a roof over their head. So I pray for those who are in fear of both having enough to eat and having a roof over their head at a time when so much uncertainty is facing every one of us. And uh, I thank you, I pray as well, church, and thank you for your support and our ministries to allow us to be able to think about those things, to reach out to people and to make that happen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
Um, a prayer from Sandy, prayers for those in leadership in our country that they listen to experts so that we can make it all through this time. Yes, as our country begins to contemplate opening um, and trying to get people back to work, uh, we pray for wisdom that we can do this well, um, that respects the dignity of work, but also respects um, the need to work. So we pray for all of that and as well as uh, our healthcare system and how we can do this well. God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. Friends, we give you thanks for all the prayers that you offer up in this space. And we, oh, there is one, uh, one more as well. I pray for, um, for Warren and his wife, who's, who, uh, who's, his mother-in-law died this past week. So we offer our prayers for, for Warren and their family uh, as well. Uh, not a COVID related, but nonetheless, we pray for her. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Friends, we give you thanks for all the prayers that you offer up, but we also, uh, we also invite everyone to pray and hold in prayer those prayers which are left unspoken. And we bring all of these prayers together, the ones we've spoken and the ones that we hold on to with ourselves, into a prayer for peace by saying, O loving God, spirit of hope and peace, lead us from death to life, Lead us from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs> I'm going to use my liturgist platform here to quickly add one more prayer, which was in the um, Zoom chat for, for us on Zoom here, which is a prayer for Sherry Crumbaugh, who we miss, um, and for happy memories for everything that she brought for our community, for her family. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And before we continue, Andy, I uh, invite you to read the responses when I do the next part uh, as well. And um, I want to offer up something else as well this week um, that we've forgotten the prayers. And I thank you, Andy, for interrupting us. Um, we're coming up to May 5th, which uh, can mean a lot of things, but for our evolved sisters and brothers is a significant day. Uh, and this also offers the, marks the five-year anniversary of the death of Wayne Schwant. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Wayne Schwant was the pastor of Evolve, um, helped lead Evolve into um, a merger with this faith community. And five years ago on May 5th, he died um, very suddenly, um, really without warning. And so we know that that day is coming up this week um, and then offer up prayers for um, my wife, Irish, whose mom died that exact same day five years ago. And so we know that we come on to this, this day, this May the 5th, carrying both of those prayers. And so the Lord certainly be with you and also with you as we move into a time of sharing and breaking bread together, which was something that um, Wayne and I certainly enjoy doing in ministry as we recognized uh, the ministry that we brought together around bread. And especially as he was known for including for us, welcoming us into worship with loaves of bread that he made himself. And so as we break bread together, let us remember the life and the ministry of Wayne um, and we give thanks to God for the joy and the love that he shared with this community and with so many others um, we cannot even count. So indeed, it is right to give our thanks and praise. For you, Creator God, the valleys laugh and sing and the trees of the field clap their hands. Your earth summons us to break silence and to be one with the song of creation. We give you thanks and praise. For you, God of all, the church in its myriad forms and countless languages honors its Savior. Millions upon millions invite us to be one with them in the drama of worship. We give you thanks and praise. In heaven beyond our seeing, the angels and saints are caught up in song. All those who have loved and lost are part of that great company. 
They call us to be one with the harmony of heaven. We give you thanks and praise. So gladly we join our voices to those of earth, sea, and sky in the universal hymn of praise which echoes through time and eternity. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. A prayer of consecration from the Iona community from which that whole liturgy was also brought let us pray. Come now, O Christ, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, forever bound to us in promise and mystery. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and wine. Let them become for us the seal and sign of your love, healing, redeeming, making us whole. And through them, let us together become for you your body, loving the world as God loves, serving its people as God wills, and always being transformed until we and all humanity resemble the one whose food we now share. People of God, if you have a piece of bread or a cracker or something, we are one grateful that we have that, that we can share it, for we know that the shelves of the supermarkets may be stripped bare of these basic essentials. Whatever you have to hand, we are grateful for it, so we invite you to take this bread wherever it may be. As Jesus broke bread, we break this bread. And as Jesus shared wine, we share this cup. Let us say the Agnes Day together. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. As those who have been invited to this table feed on this holy food through which God comes to us so that we can come to God. The bread is broken, the cup is poured. Take, eat, drink, and be full. Jesus, we have been guests at your table. Come with us wherever we go and be present in all we share. Summon out in us whom you have fed generosity of spirit to ensure that all the hungry are nourished and earth's barren places are fertile with food, faith, hope, and love. Amen.
People of God, as we continue on this day, first we invite you to join us for a coffee hour and worship, or not worship, but a coffee hour together. Um, just after this, there's a Zoom link that was sent out this morning, and I think I just tried to put it on the chat room as well. Uh, but we welcome you to, to click on that, to join us in that, in that space in a few minutes after the service. Um, and we break into small groups where we can all talk with each other and then we come back and then we go back and break into small groups again. Uh, so we hope that you can take some time to, to join us so we can all see one another and uh, continue in the life of fellowship that we are called in together. Friends, as we go from this place, remember that God has called you, that Jesus as a shepherd is that gate, as Chris reminded us that we are called to find the ways that we can set those boundaries around what we can do and what we are called to do, that we can graze on those pastures and be full so that we may be able to be good neighbors, that we may be able to be fulfilled people, that we may be able to take care of one another as ourselves. Go from this place, find those places, have permission to use them, to do what you are called to do, and be the person and the people whom God has called us to be. Go with God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.